afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. We'll get started. We're still expecting a few more, but we're, we're late and, and have limited time, and I know there's going to be a lot of discussion around our presentation today. Uh, I want to welcome you. I'm Steve McDonald, the director of the Africa program here at the center uh, and the project on leadership and building state capacity. Uh, we, uh, we are delighted today to have uh, Paciencia Kabamba, who's uh, who's actually uh, uh, was a fellow here with the Africa program in 2007. So this is a returning home for him. <laughs> and uh, he's launching his, uh, his new book, which I hope you've seen outside and will pick up a copy, if you would, called Business of Civil War, New Forms of Life and the Debris of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, uh, the, uh, obviously, we're all concerned about the situation in the Congo these days uh, and, uh, and what is happening there. I think this is going to be a, a wide-ranging subject, uh, uh, but I'm sure we'll come back to the situation on the ground repeatedly in this, this afternoon's discussion. Um, uh, and with uh, Patience, who, uh, before assuming his current position, uh, uh, he, which is Assistant Professor of International Studies at Marymount Manhattan College, uh, he taught at Emory University and the University of Notre Dame and the University of Johannesburg. Uh, I think he went to Johannesburg when he left us, if I recall. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and he has extensive exp uh, ethnographic experience on emergent social formations when s with states when states disintegrate, and particularly focused on DRC, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. Uh, we're going to ask, uh, we've asked Tony Gambino, probably well known to most of you here, to, uh, uh, to do a, a response afterwards and give us some contextual remarks before we go into a question and answer, which is the heart and soul of the matter this afternoon, of course. And I think most of you know Tony. He served as USAID director in Kinshasa in DRC for, for some time, and he's now an adjunct professor at George Georgetown University. Uh, but uh, he, too, is an author of, uh, of a number of things on the Congo, but he's very, very active on the DRC uh, in recent years um, and is one of our stronger voices on issues uh, that relate to the DRC. Uh, so I'm going to get out of the way now and uh, let Patience uh, uh, give his presentation, which will be about 10 or 15 minutes. Tony will respond for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A. So thank you very much. Patience. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Steve. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I'll use few PowerPoints, you know. Uh, I know power corrupts and PowerPoint <laughs> corrupts, uh, <laughs> absolutely. <you see. laughs> uh, before his recent book, uh, it's John Le Carré, uh, the, his recent book is Delicate Truth. Before Delicate Truth, he published Mission Song on the Congo. And he had this sentence, he said, if you are touring the world in search of bigger problems to solve, maybe DRC should be the first stop. He was not actually uh, wrong, right? and he concentrated actually his research on the Kivus, and that's what I'm going to talk today. Today, if, it, if you open your TV, you will see people still running away, M23 fighting the government. So it's really uh, things which are happening today. But I have concentrated my research on one group of people who are millionaire in US dollars in the midst of the war. It's, uh, I call them, as the title put, the non-state uh, non network. It's a social non network. You don't find them all in the Congo. You find them many places, everywhere in Africa, like this map. You see, I mean, and it's very interesting. It's very ethnically organized. You know, you have the Wolofs, or if you, if you go downtown, uh, Manhattan, you found all this, uh, I mean, the Senegalese, Wolof, and the Igbo, the Igbo are actually very well known in a kind of non-state network, the Bamileke in Northern Cameroon, the Nandi, the, the subject of our talk today, the Kikuyu in Kenya, and so you find this kind of uh, enclave of accumulation, which is generally either uh, uh, religiously based or ethnically based. So my question is that, okay, these enclave of accumulation, are they uh, good for the development of Africa or are they liability for the development of Africa? Here I talk about the, the, the Nigeria. Nigeria have these three groups, big ethnic groups, the Igbo, the Yoruba, uh, and the Hausa, who are big traders, but everything is done outside the state framework. So what does it tell us about the state in Africa? 
the, 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 the Igbo, they have factories, they manufacture uh, spare vehicles in, uh, in Nigeria and in Lagos, if you take your computer, somebody could just destroy it and put it back. So this, then all these networks are operating outside the state. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the question is that non-state social networks, as I, you have literature which tell us that these networks are social capital, actually. And the argument is that uh, networks are indigenous and non-state solution to the problem of failure of the state and the market in Africa. For people who support this group, this is the argument. So for many anthropologists and historians, these perspectives are founded on the role of trust. Many of these networks are based on trust, solidarity, local institution of credibility, and social sanction. And some few citations. Where states have failed, the profusion of social networks is seen as the source of non-state non order. Peter Little about uh, Somalia, market without state. So these are scholars who think that maybe in Africa we need to look at profoundly these non-state networks because they work better than the formal state. So you have also the, some literature. There can be a governance without government. But against this literature pro network, you have also literature against them for which uh, social networks outside the state are rather liabilities. So non-state social networks are characterized by a logic of poverty, of predation, of provisionism that block the real development of the country. So here you found a lot of political scientists and political anthropologists who see non-state social networks as a danger to the formation of a Zeberian state. So is it good for development of Africa? Is it a liability? These are the de this is the debate, actually. And some citations, uh, this is a few of them, some citation for people who are against the network. Pioneers of modern Africa, Schroeder, Diamond Users, the currency exchanges, or immigrants, all found ways to escape from the law, from boundaries of official exchanges. It is through these social practices, fraud, illegal immigration, drug fraudage, that Africa is inserted in the international community. Bayard, Bayard is uh, completely against this uh, network. Okay, uh, my point is that beyond these two kind of opposing perspective, we need, they are mostly very essentialist. To understand this network, you need to understand them individually in their context. The Aousa context in Nigeria is different from the Bamileke context or from the Igbo context. To get more from this network, we need to study them individually rather than to take them uh, as a group this is really essentializing. That, so this is uh, my point. And Meager and Hart, uh, two British uh, anthropologists, have a very productive way of understanding the word informality beyond this sterile duality. So the issue is not one of regulation, one of formal state per se, but the issue is the form of regulation based on personal relationships, such those of kinship and friendship. So the point is that uh, what we call informal networks are not opposite to formal, but they use different types of solidarities, of regulation than the market state. This is the, 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 I mean the more productive definition of informal. It's not against formal, but it uses it based on other types of uh, link of solidarities than the market state. This is why, I mean, uh, so non-state networks focus on the organizational role of social ties that shape economic behavior outside the state through embedded relations of solidarity and trust. So this is what I'm going to talk about. It's the Nandi in northeastern Congo. We all know that Congo is a completely in a chaotic situation, but the problem is that uh, 
in the front of the war, people act differently. You have people who ran away from the country when the war started in 1998. They became refugees in Uganda, Tanzania, some in the US, many of them in South Africa. Other people run away from the hot places like Goma, they to, to find safe havens in more peaceful places. These people are called IDP, internally displaced people. But another group, mostly the youth, they join the fight. We call them the Kadogo. And the, the biggest group remained all the elderly and the, the, the women mostly who are the victim of this war. But the group I want to study, I studied actually uh, people who managed to pay off for the peace. They told the rebel, you know, we know you don't have money, we have money. Let's make a deal, but one condition, you leave us in peace and we continue our business. That's the deal I will describe, how they did it. Yeah. So the Nandi, and so this is the Congo. You have this small group of the Nandi who carry on trading even today, even in the midst of the war. So this is the map of the Congo, and Butembo is uh, in the northeast, closer to Kampala. So uh, the war in Congo, as we know, have a devastating humanitarian toll. That is the most severe uh, civil war we have. So as of 2006, out of the population of 58 million Congolese, as many as four million have died. And the, the number have increased today. People talk about six million. Seven million suffered from malnutrition. Three million were HIV positive. At least 40,000 had been victim of sexual violence. 2.4 million were internally displaced. 880,000 had been refugees. And two million children were orphans. This I took it from C.V. Coleman. So these are humanitarian consequences. It was not only humanitarian, but all the coercion power were fragmented. But in 1998, Congo had three main rebel groups, a dozen of Congolese militia, rebel group from Uganda, from Burundi, and, and from Sudan. We have also the Interhamwe, the, the militia from Rwanda, uh, who are blamed from the 94 genocide. All of them were in Congo and the FDLF. All these groups were in Congo. So to talk about the monopoly of violence, I mean, it, it was meaningless. That's, uh, that's so you have humanitarian and this. So when I went in 2000, 2005 in Butembo, people were fighting everywhere. This is North Kivu. In the Ruchuru, you have the FDLF and the inter -Amwe. This is the safe heaven. In Masisi, that time, Kunda, General Kunda Batuare was there with almost uh, 2,000 soldiers he was controlling. And Kunda was kind of the representative of Congolese Tutsi in the Congo. He was fighting the FDLF. For whom, for them, the FDLF carry on the genocide mentality into Congo. In Walikali, actually, the Hunde who are old uh, from that region have been displaced by the Tutsi population. So you had ethnic uh, conflict in Walikali. So all these phase people were fighting. And then in Oriental province, the, in Hituri, you all knew the fight between Lendu and Hema. So all around people were fighting except in Butembo in 2005. And in Butembo, it was not only peaceful, but trade was booming. People carry on going to Kampala. From Kampala, they fly to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, they sell what, whatever they have to sell, uh, mostly gold, as I'll talk about. They leave half of their money in the banks there. The other half, they go to Jakarta, Guangzhou, China, buy all sorts of things, cars, uh, textile, motorbike ship them to Mombasa, from Mombasa to Kampala, and back to Butembo. Then during the war, the business continued in 2005. 
So my question of research was that how in the absence of effective state sovereignty and national government, there was no Congo that time, and in the presence of numerous armed contenders for power, traders have managed to build and protect self-sustaining prosperous transnational economic enterprise in Eastern Congo. That, is, that was the question of research. How come that we've been surrounded by war in a completely destroyed state, and with all these rivals, the traders carry on this business? So that was my question. So now I will try to take you with me to understand what happened, why these people we're so, uh, so first of all, yes, we're not picking you up. We're doing webcast live, and because we're oh. not using the mic, we're not picking you up. Uh, it's fine. Webcast, so. No, it's on. It's on? Okay. Yeah. Good. Derek, sure it's fine now? You move it around on the side. Oh, sure. Okay. okay. That's good. Thank you. So, uh, in Butembo, there are a lot of traders. If you go, you land there, the first thing you see is shops all over the city. So I decided to concentrate on the biggest traders, the millionaire. I call them G8. I could call them G20, just say, uh, close that. Yeah. So uh, G8 includes uh, a dozen of import export traders who are millionaire in US dollar amount. And who have gradually captured the social and economic surplus within the Nanda, uh, the Nanda society. That's uh, for definition. What do they import? They import containers of goods ranging from textile, motorbike, and automobile to spare engine, medicine, and other goods from East Africa, from Persian Gulf, so, uh, Southeast Asia, and China. What do they export? That's the most important. What do they sell outside? So uh, they export agricultural products ranging from coffee, potato, beans, papaya, latex, and other vegetables, in addition to minerals such as gold, coltan, wolfram, and cassiterite. The group demonstrated a great level of internal cohesion and trust between the members. Uh, this group in Butembo is very well known the way they do business. When I went there, I was living with the, the Catholic priests. As a graduate student, I tried to have interview with these uh, traders. I couldn't. After four months, I had zero interview. Then I moved. I went from the Catholic priest to a very popular quarter, and, and the family accepted to hire me. And a week later, I got my first interview with one of these businessmen. I asked him, but I tried for four months to talk to you. Why you say you were staying with the priest? You know, the priest has power. Now, now you are you are defenseless. You are in the city, so I have nothing to fear. So, so people who do field work, where you stay matters. You know. <laughs> so, uh, but the most important thing, what I understood, is this trust. One of them told me that he borrowed. $40,000 for another trader. My question is, did you sign a paper? I said, no, why? I said, why? And if you don't pay, what will happen? Will you go to court? I say, no. But all the other traders will know I didn't pay, and that's it for me. So this is really the cohesion. That's what makes it uh, stronger. It's based on trust. Uh, this is uh, the to the commodity chains of gold. You have gold diggers, gold buyers, gold counters in Butembo, and of course it ends up uh, in our banks here. It is. So now I try to understand why these people have been so rich. What did this, what does it, where does it come from? And for that, since I'm an anthropologist, I wanted to use a kind of historical perspective. Actually, Butembo, used to be called Lusambo, is standing on the road of Arab caravan in the 16th, 17th century. The Arab who were going to, bar, uh, to look for ivory were stopping in Butembo. Butembo was a stopover. So the idea of long, long distance trade was not strange for them. It was a kind of second nature. 
you know, and they, people, things, pre-colonial time, they start going to Uganda, trying to uh, look for salt and then come back. So this is the first thing I noticed, that for this group, long distance trade was kind of second nature for them. And during the colonial time, of course, the, the country was colonized by the Belgian, but many of the business, especially agricultural business, was at the hand of the Greek. The Nandi told me that during the colonial time, they, what they got best was the Protestant education. Congo was colonized by the Belgium, but mostly by also with the Catholic Church. In the Eastern Congo, the Protestant managed to have a room, mostly in the, the border of Uganda. And many of the Baptists who went there came from Philadelphia. And many of the traders, the two, uh, three quarters of the traders are all Baptist. And this experience for them is very, was very, very determinant to what they're doing. Well, how? Kamungele is the greatest trader now in Butembo. He's a Protestant. This is what he told me, what they learned from the Baptist school, from the mission. First, Dedication to hard, honest work, working hard even if the boss was absent. Second, not to waste your earning in alcohol and prostitution. But third, and the most important, is learning how to delay gratification. This might seem very spiritual or kind of uh, literal, but for them, this was the foundation and the discipline they get to become millionaire. It's linked. They can't divorce their wealth today with this training they had with the Baptist. And today, post-colonial uh, era, the Nandi, the traders are organized in a group. They have uh, an association of traders. Each of them is responsible for 50 kilometers of road to mend. And because all the truck come this road, if your 50 kilometers are not good, they ask you what's going on. So there is a kind of a self-control. It's one of the country, one of the part of the country with very good roads, of course, except uh, Katanga, which is mineral, and uh, a bit by Congo. But this is done by people themselves. The Catholic institution is the second biggest kind of uh, power in the region. Actually, the Catholic bishop is the most important person in the region. Why? The Catholic run a university University of Graben, they have medicine, civil engineering, and uh, law school, and they run a hospital, they run orphanages, and all this is run through mostly donation by the traders. I questioned one day the, the bishop in an interview, and he was explaining to me how they made the library. He wrote a list of 100 books and he gave them to all the traders, telling them during your trip to Europe, to Dubai, or anywhere, if you may, you could bring us this book. And all of them, without exception, brought the 100 books the bishop asked. That's how they started the library. Of course, they got gifts also from France and everywhere. So it's really people, these rich people, very rich people, they understand themselves rich inside the community. They can't imagine themselves rich outside the community. I'll explain why. So, of course, uh, I thought that these two groups, the traders and the Catholic Church, were the foundation of the social cohesion in Butembo. After a year, I realized that I was wrong. There was a third element. 
If you go uh, outside Butembo in the north, there is a place called Vurondo, where you have the militia are based there. The militia are kind of junior partners to traders. And uh, how did I realize that was um, the Nandi tried to build uh, a dam, a hydroelectrical dam, and they ask engineers from France. The engineers from France say that to have a dam to electrify the region, you need 80 million. It was too much. And the South African engineer came and said, I could do it with half, Claxon Power. And Mr. Claxon Power, they made a deal, he started doing the job, but he realized that people were not giving what they pledged. Somebody will pledge $50,000, he will only give 20000 So he got scared. Instead of stopping, he started bringing second-hand material, carry on with the dam. At the end, what happened was that everybody was not were dissatisfied because the dam didn't work as expected. They gave very few kilowatt. So the traders called him and said, what's happening? He said, listen, the problem is that I don't have the money I expected. Now, with the few kilowatt, they start discussing on who should commercialize it. Claxon Power thought that he will get the money and the commercialization so that he get back the rest of his money. The trader said, no, 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 we will commercialize it and give you the rest, uh, we continue with somebody else. So there was a dispute in the room, Claxon Power walked out of the room and he drove to the city uh, half an hour later, there was a rumor in the city that a white man, a Muzungu, was kidnapped by the rebels. Muzungu was kidnapped by the rebels. Everybody heard that. So what? And guess what? Who went to liberate the Muzungu? It was the traders. So he understood that he should not commercialize power. So that's, the deal. So that's to say the type of relationship they had between the, 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 this uh, militia and uh, the traders. So seen economically, militia... The militia then uh, look like junior partner to traders. And the most important also thing also is the relationship between the militia and uh, the Catholic Church. I wanted to go to Vrondo. A friend of mine advised me to take, to, to borrow the bishop's car. I say, why the bishop's car? I say, yes, if you want to be safe, because Many of the militia in Burundi are either choir mem former choir member or former altar boys. So they have a huge respect for the bishop. So these are the relationship between the three. Uh, so what makes the cohesion in that place, even during the war, is what I put there is there seem to be a very clear social and political hegemony of the Nande bourgeoisie legitimated through the Catholic officialdom premised upon not one, but several relatively mobile formations of violence that supply the ultimate resource of cohesion, and that's the social order. So it's this alliance between uh, the, the traders who have the commercial power, the Catholic Church with the development ideas, and the coercive power brought by this. Uh, this, why we, this is how I explain this relative cohesion in the midst of the war. Oh, five minutes left. Yeah. But of course, these traders have to fight between two spaces, what I call the space of engagement. In Butembo, uh, the space of dependency. In Butembo, every time there is funeral, you see them there. Every time something need donation, they give money. They want to be part of the community. They can't imagine themselves out, reach outside that community. That's the biggest difference between the millionaire in Butembo and the millionaire elsewhere as we have them. We, this is the space of dependency. But they need to make a balance with the space of engagement when they go to Dubai, when they go to Jakarta. This help them actually to overcome all the obstacle you can, the African infrastructure, family infrastructure could have on capitalist accumulation. So they have to make this balance between the two spaces. Not one space should overwhelm the other. If you are too much in, 
you are swallowed. Finish. You have to redistribute all your stuff. But if you are too much out, you will not recognize that's it for you uh, with others. So it's a, it's a delicate balance which makes them actually very strong to be in the community, dependency, and to be outside, engaged. And also, uh, I'll go quickly here. What I have observed in Butembo, I'm from the southwest on the border of Angola. So I had to go to Butembo for my research to learn the language, to, to, to adapt to the diary, the, the food, everything. So I was kind of in the Congo, but completely outside my region. But what I understood in Butembo is that because many people trade, most of the time they trade the same thing. I'm talking about petty traders. So there are a lot of rivalries, a lot of kind of, it's a rat race to find clients. Because imagine 10 women selling the shoes. When there is a client, everybody, so because of this internal rat race, I call it uh, intra-ethnic tension, they've developed a, a very good relations with others. The extra-ethnic relations are very good. This is the opposite from where I come from. Where I come from, we feel good amongst us, and extra we exclude the others. And that's what you found generally. And this is due to trade. They have very good relationship with Arabs, or with uh, the Chinese, with, and this is because of this fierce battle in Butembo. This is, this is very good for anthropology. So of course, uh, I was describing kind of uh, Butembo. I mean, this is a romantic place to be, uh, but there are also struggles, you know. The major struggle is between the traders and the elders. This is a rural community used to be, where the elders are the most important. Every, they have, the Nande have family meetings, I mean, every month or so, yeah. Before, a few years ago, when the elder of the family is there, you start the meeting. But today, when the rich person of the family is not there, you postpone the meeting. So I question the elders. Say, you're losing your ground. What's happening? They say, yes, but in these meetings, what do we talk about? Weddings, funerals, and all sorts of organizations which need money. They, brought m they bring money. So there is a consciousness. The second group is intellectuals, people who teach at university. They have PhDs from Paris, from Belgium, from but because the state doesn't pay, they have no say in the things of the community. The traders have bigger say. So you have this kind of tension between intellectual elite, who is moneyless, and most uneducated traders with money. And this is, you could feel it. And another tension, or rather an observation, as an anthropologist I was interested in, it is the entire community is being mercantilized. The most important person is not the PhD professor, but is this trader. We have uh, an anecdote. Say, a few years ago, when you date a girl in Butembo, she asked you two questions. Who are your parents, and where do you study? Today, she asked you two questions. Where is your shop, and when is your next trip to Dubai? <laughs> so, I mean, this kind of the mercantilization of the entire community, this is, I mean, very good for, uh, but okay, now uh, I'll conclude in five minutes. We see this, and the label we say, this is Congo is a failed state. That's the discourse you hear. My question is that what have failed? Are the Nande also failed state? The, this, it's not a theory. The discourse of failed state have three flaws, and I'll end up there. The first one, is that the idea of failed states is very misleading. It gives us the impression that the state were integrated before and now it's falling apart. Nowhere in Africa, in no time, the Weberian state have ever taken root, only because it was imposed from outside. It was colonially imposed. The state never grew up organically. 
never have civil war, uh, civil right war, as you have in the U.S. All this constitute all these moments constitute the state. We had a colonially imposed state with many ethnic groups. We never had a kind of political consensus because Africa, many African countries, Congo, were conceived as an extractive space, not a political space. Second, people who talk about failed state, they conflate the fail of government with the fail of governance. Here, clearly, there's no fail of governance. The government is not there. So we can't confuse them, the two. And third, people talk about fail state. The non-fail state is taken as a normative. Of course, the US is a non-fail state, seen maybe from DC, from Silicon Valley, but if you see it from the neighborhood of Moore House in Atlanta, where I was, it's more than failed. So non-fail state is an ideal. It's an ideal. It's an ideal. This doesn't exist somewhere. I mean, it's a, these are the three things, uh, uh, the three remarks I have against fail state. And to finish, there is a corollary to the fail state idea. We have 17,000 peacekeepers. William Zatman, who is uh, our neighbor here, in his uh, talk about failed states, say that the solution to the failed state is to restore the pre fail arrangement. So the 17,000 peacekeepers in the Congo have gone there to restore the state. What did they do in 2006? They organized presidential elections. Ask them, but why you didn't organize more local elections? People know each other. Maybe they will choose people, say, I mean, we're not socialized in dealing with the locals, socialized with dealing the pr with the top. And, of course, the Kabila was elected in 2006, but the war continued. It's like building, you know, the, the perfect, perfectly built, top-down building, you know? And uh, the only architecture which is perfectly built top-down, as you all know, is a grave, no? <laughs> okay, I'll end there and pass to Tony. Thank you. Nicely done, Patience. I'm going to find that map in. Okay, Tony, you have an awful lot to deal with there in a short amount of time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is a fabulously rich presentation, and what I'm going to try to do is, uh, we don't need, we're just going to stay with, no, no, go back to the map that was Sorry, there. he just went to that map on yeah, purpose. Just, just oh, keep yeah. going, yeah. Just bring it up large, yeah. Uh, all that I'm going to try to do is contextualize it. Um, there's a fabulous group here of people. Uh, I'm delighted to see a number of Congolese friends and many people who are very familiar with the Congo, including uh, the fascinating story of the Nande. But there are also people here who I know have heard about the Nande this afternoon for the first time. So let's put this story in a little, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to put it in the best context for a Washington audience uh, and try to get some lessons out of the richness of this wonderful presentation and fascinating book. The first point I'll make is if you just read the press on Congo, you hear all the time about a war, and then you hear about Eastern Congo. And if you're not paying much attention, you would think that there's a war in all of Eastern Congo. Well, this presentation made very clear that that's not the case. But for people who don't know, it's a country as big as the US east of the Mississippi. So Washington to St. Louis or Minneapolis, Miami to northern Maine. Eastern Congo then would be half of that. That would be this whole area. Is there fighting in this whole area today? No. The worst fighting that we're talking about right now relating to the M23 is right here, and it's no bigger than where my finger is. So the worst fighting today is the size of my finger in the size of the Congo. Second, if you get a little more expert, you say, oh, no, 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 no. We're not really focused on all of Eastern Congo. We're focused on North Kivu. Isn't North Kivu a mess? 
And we've just heard from patients something very important that the vast majority of people who think they know a lot about the Congo actually don't understand. The answer to that question is no, not all of North Kivu is a mess. There are very serious problems in the southern half of North Kivu, where we have the M23 group, the FDLR group from Rwanda, a series of Mai Mai groups, and a lot of problems that patients referred to very briefly during his presentation. But it's the northern part of North Kivu, you see Butembo on this map, this is the area, the northern part of North Kivu, that is controlled by the Nande ethnic group. And that group, as patients said, has been stable for a long time and is stable today and has not been under any serious threat from M23 or any of the problems that have roiled the southern part of North Kivu for many years, but under M23 for well over a year now. So the southern part of North Kivu in American terms is roughly the size of Maryland. The northern part of North Kivu where the Nande are also roughly the size of Maryland. Now, we talked about the trading, and I want to put that in some context, too. Congo used to have a network of road and rail. It still has a big network of rivers. How does that relate to Nande trading within the Congo today? The rail network, for all intents and purposes, has collapsed. There used to be an, a rail network basically linked to the river network constructed by the, the rail network constructed by the Belgians. That network, for all intents and purposes, has collapsed. The road network is in very bad shape, as patients refer to. But, particularly since 2006, there actually has been a fair amount of road building by a variety of actors the World Bank, the European Union, the Chinese, a variety of others. USAID has actually funded some road building too. So let's look at this area. Again, this is the area around Butembo where the Nande group is dominant. Before, there is a road to the very important regional capital of Kisangani. This road basically uh, collapsed. It's a dirt road. All the roads I'm going to refer to are dirt roads. But after 2006, this road was rebuilt. There was a very important road from Uganda that runs basically from Ishasha down to Goma. This road was in very bad shape. It was rebuilt by the UN recently. And I can tell you, I've seen this with my own eyes, actually. Kisangani which in the early years of this century was one of the most depressed cities on earth. If you go there now, the shops are filled with electronics and goods coming from Dubai, coming from, and who gets them there? The Nande. I want to make a couple points there. It's the Nande realities that were described so well that by patients that are important, but the Nande couldn't have constructed the road. The road is outside of Nande controlled territory. So it is international actions that then created the opening which the Nande took advantage of. The Ishasha Goma road is actually entirely out of the Nande area. It's close to, but out of the Nande area. And today, if you would want to go north from Goma, you'd go through the fighting that's happening now involving M23. You'd go through a zone con controlled by the FDLR. You'd go through zones controlled by different Mai Mai groups. And guess what? Trucks have been rolling every day from Goma into Uganda. And many of those trucks, not all, but many of them, again, are financed. And the arrangements come from Nande, who have a very substantial presence in the city of Goma. They also have an important presence in the city of Kisangani. So, I just want to give it a little bit of national context as, one of, as my first point. Um, the Nande story, as Patience tells it, uh, is one of good news and 
some bad news, and I, I want to talk about both. Um, just to emphasize the point that he made, very much unlike other regions of Congo, this region is really ethnically homogeneous. And that has been good news for reasons that patients described, but I would look to Congolese here and others to either accept or dispute what I'm about to say. Um, but my information suggests that the Nande take pretty strong measures to keep it ethnically homogeneous. So if you're from another group and you say, hey, I want some of that action coming out of Butembo, Baini, et cetera, and you try to set up your own operation, some of those militia that Patience was describing might visit your shop and destroy it. Um, this is the, the ethnic homogeneity is seen as a strong protector by the Nande community, and they go to great lengths to preserve it in their zone of control. Um, I think it's also important to mention the geography. The main land where the Nande are dominant is unlike the geography of much of the Congo. It is highly mountainous. Some of the areas are so high that it gets quite cold during some seasons of the year. The Baptist missionaries that patients referred to constructed their homes with fireplaces, and the fireplaces were not for show. They needed those fireplaces on the cold nights. And having been there, you need heavy sweaters and things you certainly don't need in places like Kisangani or Kinshasa um, in the Congo. But my point here is that the geography has created uh, something of a protection. It's not easy to get into the area that the Nandes control and given them something of their special circumstance. Next point about the Nande is unlike other, some other groups in the Congo, they have maintained a focus on local development. The traders that were referred to, the Catholic Church that was referred to others, are interested in what happens in their part of the Congo. And the resources that come, as best as I can tell, stick in this territory controlled by the Nande. What, by, what I mean by that is you do not find, by and large, the kind of traders, the G8, building villas in the south of France <laughs> or doing other things or moving to Kinshasa as many other Congolese elite do when they get some resources. They stay in their home area and therefore their wealth sticks. And so you have all the kind of multiplier effects that economists like to talk about occurring in that area that benefits development. Let's, let's contrast that to politics in the Congo in general. If you are in other parts of the Congo and you want to become wealthy, and I'm generally referring to men, because this still in the Congo is do dominated by males, uh, too often your first choice is to look to violence. So power through the barrel of a gun, if you will, or whatever violent mean you have. So when we're talking about the southern part of North Kivu, South Kivu, Manyema, other parts of Eastern Congo in particular that remain violent, various ethnic groups in those parts of Eastern Congo have large groups that are using violence as a way to power and resources. The next tool used is what I'll call softer forms of power, where it's not direct violence, but most traditionally through either a government position or a quasi-governmental position, meaning if you're a traditional chief or have some other customary role. And then you can use that as a way to get resources from others. And 
It's important to describe the difference, and I found a lovely sentence in, this is actually Patience's book, that is for sale outside. Um, there is a, a great sentence uh, in here that gives the contrast. I'll read it for you now. He says, the central thesis of Janet McGaffey's Entrepreneurs and Parasites, the struggle for indigenous capitalism in Zaire, is that entrepreneurs like the Nande, who are not closely tied to the state, have contributed significantly more to local development than the state parasites who drain off their region's wealth without giving much in return. And you can summarize, I think, quite a bit of what Patience was trying to say in that this small part of the Congo dominated by the Nande ethnic group is controlled by entrepreneurs who are interested in creating wealth and having that wealth stay in their zone. Whereas many other locations in the Congo are controlled by, I'll quote McGaffey again because it's provocative but I think powerful and accurate, parasites who drain off their region's wealth without giving much in return. I want to end, because I'm really looking forward to discussion, um, with two questions that I know many of you will find provocative, but my intention is not merely to provoke, it's to make sure everybody's awake at this time in the afternoon um, and uh, try to get to some discussion going. So here's my first question. Is this area controlled by the Nande, the Rwanda of the Congo? What I mean by that is Congo's small neighbor, Rwanda. It's Rwanda, by the way, for comparison's sake, is 1 90th the physical size of the Congo, 1 90th. Yet it has a flourishing economy, uh, a lot of trade, a great effort on getting into international trade networks, great efforts to rely on resources, including gold, uh, and a hope to move forward in uh, ethnic, uh, economic development. Well, my answer is yes and no. The area is a bit like Rwanda in that there is a tremendous focus on economic development. You certainly find that emphasis. If any of you have been to Kigali or uh, anywhere in Rwanda recently, that's just undeniable. But no, there's some crucial differences between the area controlled by the Nande in North Kivu and Rwanda itself. I'll give just a few. There are many more, but these are the ones that I think might be among the most important. Number one, the Nande area is ethnically homogeneous. Rwanda is not, no matter what President Kagame or others tell you. There are deep ethnic divides, uh, regardless of how one wants to tease out where those ethnic divides come from, they're real, and they matter in Rwandan society today. Second, the area controlled by the Nande is absolutely part of the Congo, as far as I know, there is no interest from any quarter of the Nande, despite the fact that they get nothing from the state, to say, why don't we create an independent land of the Nande? But there is no interest in this whatsoever. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Whereas, of course, Rwanda is not part of the Congo, so there's a completely different phenomenon of how Rwanda relates to the Congo. The third crucial is that as Patience said, the Nande territory has a whole series of advantages. I've talked about a few, the geography, the ethnic homogeneity, but I want to emphasize a point that Patience made, the resources, both agricultural and mineral. Uh, compared to Rwanda, which certainly compared to Eastern Congo and this part of Eastern Congo is, for all intents and purposes, devoid of resources, very, very poor in terms of natural resource endowment. The final difference 
in the short list of differences between the area controlled by the Nande and Rwanda is that the Nande have maintained their local focus. One can think of some national politicians who come from this ethnic group, but they do not dominate their region in the way that politicians from other areas in the Congo really dominate. You think of other regions of the, pol of the Congo and you think of an individual or a small group of individuals as really dominant forces in the political economic life of that area. Not the case with the Nanda. You think of larger groups and very much focused on the traders, as patients said. Again, contrasted with Rwanda, which particularly in the 1990s and the early part of this century had national ambitions in the Congo. They wanted to control the entire Congo, and, and, and they did, in effect, for a while in the latter part of the 1990s. And many of us think that that overreaching by Rwanda during that period uh, is being played out now with potentially negative consequences for that country over time. This is not something that has happened with the Nande. My final question, which goes a little bit along the lines of uh, Patience's ending when he spoke about failed states. When we think about this area and all the good things are hap that are happening, economic development, et cetera, is this a model for the Congo? What, is what the Nande are doing? Is, is that, we just did that? Would Congo be a great place? Well, again, my answer is yes and no. Yes, because the focus on trade and the focus on using the benefits of trade for the broader development of the society is just fundamental to economic development, to any theory of economic development, to any reality of economic development. And as I tried to suggest earlier, is what is we do not see in many other parts of the Congo. But no, because as I suggested earlier, the characteristics that we see within the area controlled by the Nande, particularly the ethnic homogeneity, are not repeated elsewhere in the Congo. And surely, we don't want to see a Congo with kind of ethnic cleansing. This has been done in other countries by the, uh, of the world, by the way. But the solution is to cleanse different places. And so we'll have one group dominant here, and another group dominant there, and a number of other group dom dominant there. And then we'll figure out ways to relate one another. That would be a catastrophe for the Congo. So the model of ethnic homogeneity doesn't get us anywhere in the Congolese context. Rather, one has to come back, I believe, and patients referred to this a little bit, to the concept of full democracy and good governance. We had national elections in 2006. We had provincial elections in 2007. There were supposed to be local elections thereafter there have not been local elections in the Congo. There must be local elections to try to begin slowly, painfully, to create the systems of a local accountability and reliability that would allow over time to get some of the benefits of economic development that we see pro so profoundly in the area controlled by the Nande. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Well, we're only left with about a half an hour uh, for questions and answers, so, so we'll get right to it uh, to save time. Let me remind you that we're being webcast, so when I recognize you, uh, be sure to wait for the microphone so the uh, watching audience and the archives will be able to hear you and know who you are, identify yourself. And because of the, the crush of time, I think we'll take two or three uh, uh, questions, comments at a time before we ask uh, uh, Patience and uh, Antonio to make any responses. So, the floor. Uh, first hand is always right here. Mm -hmm. Nope, nope, here. There you go. Thank you. Uh, great presentations. Um, uh, my name is Max Kelly. I'm a uh, consultant with Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, and actually, uh, Patience and surprised our path, or our paths did cross, although unknowingly I was in Congo for much of 2006 as well. Um, question is in your description of the political economy of this island of peace in a patchwork of conflict. Uh, you talked a lot about sort of endogenous features of the Nanda area. Um, but I was surprised that you didn't reference 
the, why, the role that the Nande and that particular area of Grand Nord de Kivu uh, played uh, for uh, players in other parts of the, con of the Congo and also the international players. So that area being on the border, you know, sharing a, the border crossing with Uganda at Fort Portal, being a key uh, pathway for uh, illicit uh, looted goods, looted natural resources to pass through, um, looted natural resources from all of the different factions in much of uh, Oele and, and the Kivus, et cetera, uh, such that there was an interest, or I guess my question is, do you think that there was an interest uh, on the part of the international sponsors of, militia, of various militia and rebel groups, as well as the local leaders of those rebel groups, in keeping this avenue, this portal open, because frankly, it was the way they could continue to profit. Uh, it was their one of the key links to international markets for their looted resources. Thank you. So, uh, up, right up here, right up here. Right on this end, and then right there. Sorry. No, no right hand. You, you, you had your hand. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Pastor, as you were talking, I, I <coughs> was struck by what I think is a parallel between the immensely success, immense, immense success of Venice as a city-state and trading empire for a thousand years, an adjunct to probably a failed state called the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and I think if you study the history of Venice, you'll probably also arrive at the conclusion that it, it really, that model really wasn't exportable to the rest of the Holy Roman Empire for much the same reasons. But I wonder if there is a, you also mentioned the Catholic connection and the importance of religion. <coughs> Our mutual friend Alex Deli, who is a leader of the Disciples of Christ Church, says that there are more congregations, more members of the Disciples of Christ Protestant uh, Church in the DRC than there are in the United States. So it's not just a Catholic uh, church that unites the country of the DRC, but also some Protestant groups. So I wonder, do you see that kind of commonality as, as possibly an important way in which some of the successful elements of the Nande experience could be replicated throughout the country. And is this something that people like Alex Deli and I should be working on with people like you? Okay, and all the way at the back in the middle. Attempt, s attempt some answers. Uh, my name is Abdel Maliki and I'm uh, from the Global Civil Initiative. And uh, great job and uh, great analysis about the Nande population. Uh, but I want to broaden the horizon a little bit to all of us who's on this table from Africa. And I realize that in your studies and research, the same thing who's happening with the Nande can be replicated uh, with uh, the Igbo in Nigeria, the wall of uh, in uh, Senegal, and uh, the Yoruba in the state of Benin, the country of Benin. And my question is, how can we make sure that this model, who is really working in those countries, can be replicated into the level of the country of Africa in order to make sure that, okay, it better the development of the population and it, uh, it make a sustainable growth the qualitative one and the quantitative one that we're seeing in Africa so far. And to finish up, the case of uh, the DRC, it's we're saying that real state and uh, there is war going on, but in the case of Senegal, Benin, Nigeria, we don't see those type of war, but we're seeing the same type of product and the same type of development happening. Thank you, Patrice. All right, we've got the three questions, and both of you can uh, attempt to answer is the first on, uh, on uh, what was the international role in keeping that portal open uh, uh, for the Nande uh, uh, to the outside world. Uh, the Venice uh, <laughs> Roman Empire comp comparison, but how does that replicate through the, through the uh, country in terms of uh, the broader religious community, uh, not just the Catholics? And then uh, can this inform Africa itself? Does this, uh, does this actually work? Uh, in other parts of Africa where you have similar ethnic situations. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the questions. I'll start and then Tony will say something. Uh, about um, 
international players, um, sometime I asked, uh, if you go to Goma, Goma has a lot of um, uh, IDP camp. You see all, it extends the Murunga 1, Murunga 2, Murunga 3. And Goma actually attracts a lot of NGOs, a lot of money. I, if you ask people from NGO, I did, why can't you come over north, further north, in the Grand North? No, they won't say no, no. The, the Nande, I mean, if you go there first, you have to rent their cars, you have to rent, also all the money will end up to the traders, local traders. I mean, it is. So uh, the Nande so far have been uh, left alone even by NGOs. Uh, generally, of course, people uh, export gold, but you don't find gold only in the Nande area. You also find it all around with others. And sometimes it's paid with cash to militia or sometimes with weapons. And a great friend of mine was assassinated uh, during the because he was accused uh, of exchanging gold with weapons in Mungualu region. He very, very was a very well-known trader. And uh, so... Uh, Yes, the Nandi, I mean, if you ask NGOs, international players to go there, they won't go. They will not go. They, because uh, it's not sexy enough to attract money. That's the only reason. But it will be very interesting to make the link between this quote-unquote quote successful case and also the misery or in the, in the periphery of it. And for me, there is a link, and it's better. So... Um, the the Kasindi uh, is used by, of course, by militia. Everything goes through there, also by the Nand. But, um, okay, the looting of national resources. I have a very different take on that. Why people pay tax? We pay tax and we expect a return on that, on roads, on school. On Imagine you don't have returns. Will you continue paying taxes? This is kind of the major question that uh, a law is a relationship which is codified under certain condition. And I think when the conditions which led to the codification, objectifications are no longer there, the law should stop. That's a there's in the book there's a major difference between the looting uh, in south, uh, in south of the North Kivu, what Goma, what uh, Tony described, and the looting in up north, everything comes back in the local region. But the looting further down Goma, over, that's it's it built the neighboring country. That's the major difference I see for me. And and should we call it looting uh, in the absence of? Uh, uh, national government, serious in the predatory government. Why should we give them money? I mean, uh, next week I'm going to Brussels to talk about the customer services. Customer services in Beni, they have built huge houses because of the bribe with the money from customers. There's nothing goes to the treasury, so why should we pay them? I mean, this is. Uh, I have a big question with this illegal looting or legal. So it's really a relationship we need to review. So I, I don't know, it's disputable, I know. So, uh, but Venice is uh, very interesting. One day, I think it was here, I gave a talk on this, and somebody stood up and said, I'm a professor of ancient history of Rome. I feel that what you described is exactly the same. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm a student of Charles Tilly. Uh, who wrote The Beginning of Modern State with the Mafia, the racketeers, and uh, all. Uh, yes, I, I agree with you. There are features of the Mafia there, but the problem is that uh, in front of a predatory state, the Nande have shown a level of imagination which helped them to keep a social cohesion compared to the rest. This is, I don't know, I... I'm not saying that it's great, it's the model, no. I'm an anthropologist, I just limit myself in that thing. I can't normalize it. 
And that's the biggest problem of replica replicability. Is this replicable in the rest of the country? I think no, because of the specificity of the Nandi. Uh, Tony talked about geography. And one other thing we should add is they are on the border with Uganda. If you cross to Uganda, you speak the same language. There was a treaty between the British and the Belgium on this space. So the next door in Uganda, they are not called the Nande, they are called the Konjo. But it's all the Euro group, they speak the same language. So there's no linguistic barrier. So that's what helps understand that the, the cross border is quite easy. You know, and all the big business, they have addresses in Kampala. And when the, 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 the Kabila Laurent came, invaded Congo, and the Ugandan came to Congo, for the Nandi, it was not an invasion. And the Konjo warned Museveni that nothing should be done to in the Nandi region, which is, should be devastated. Because many Konjo are general in the uh, Uganda defense forces. So it's a really, this is particular to the Nandi. What could be replicated is that Janice McGaffey was doing research there um, since the 70s, and he talked about this entrepreneurial spirit. I think this one could be, I mean, you found them in Kisangani, in Goma, and now they are going to Kinshasa. Many now they are moving to Kinshasa. So this could be actually this, because trade, all these Protestant qualities, you don't, of doing trade, could be expanded. That, that's what I think. So about the church, um, yes, I think that the, the role of the church had not been really very much theorized in the African state formation. We talk, people talk uh, the pre-colonial, like during the colonial time, the Catholic church, but of course the Protestant church, even today, is very strong. It needs much more theorization I mean, in this area. Uh, I think this is, uh, there's room. I mean, there's room for research to understand their contribution. What uh, is, and um, it's this, the same, you know. Uh, is it a model? I don't think that it's a model because, uh, you know, the process of modelization means that you claim a certain universality. It could be a transport. It's. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. I don't pretend to a normative uh, uh, kind of conclusions. This is what I've seen in Butembo now, and this is how I tend to explain how it's working. So uh, in Senegal, you have other type of uh, kind of unity, the Wolof, the, the religion, the in Nigeria, the, the history, the, the, the Yoruba or the Igbo. So uh, as uh, Mega, I quoted, say, these social networks could be social capital or social liability depending on the context. So it's better focus, understand them in their own context. You can make a judgment, a general judgment for all of them. So. Just very briefly because uh, I want to make sure we have time for another round. Uh, I'll only comment on one of the questions about the issues relating to religion. Uh, and I would just add that uh, beyond the very positive phenomena that patients referred to coming from both the Catholic and Protestant churches that you see not only in the areas he described where the Nande are dominant, but elsewhere in the Congo, there is another phenomenon increasingly widespread in the Congo that I believe one can only see as negative. And it comes largely, I'm not painting the whole sector, but just an aspect of the sector, of a series of churches that are called Eglise de Réveil, fundamentalist churches. And there is a uh, important subset of the Eglise de Réveil in the Congo that do not play on the kind of very positive points that patients made when he listed the virtues that people felt they got from their Baptist training or some of the other messages that can come from the church, but really play to the extreme hopelessness that has felt in much of the Congo because of the worsening poverty that is seen in the capital city, that is seen in many other places, and blames that uh, 
poverty and hopelessness on a series of odd phenomenon, whether they're children that are accused of being witches or a variety of other really terrible things that go on to try to uh, divert populations into extremely negative behaviors. And I just wanted people to understand that we're seeing all three of these. We're seeing still very positive, I believe, actions taken by what you might want to call mainstream churches. Uh, Catholic and Protestant, but a subset, I, again, I want to be very clear, I'm not saying that all fundamentalist churches are this way, that's not the case. There's some very positive fund people who are of fundamentalist belief, but there is an important subset that did not exist in the Congo before this century that is now an extraordinarily important and I think deeply negative part of Congolese society today. Okay, thank you. We do have time for one more round of questions. Um, I didn't get down here at the back, so that lady right in front of you there, sir. I, yep. And the lady next to her. The next one. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good, hmm? good afternoon. My name is Selvi Maunga. I'm from Democratic Republic of Congo, and I'm Nande. I'm from Gutembo. Uh -huh. I'm really glad you're talking about my ethnic <laughs> 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 And I also had the chance to work in Gutembo for, for seven years, so I know what I'm talking about. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation because it's a, it's a really great advocacy job because you are for 10 years people have been talking about don't go to invest in Congo because there is no any safe uh, place to, to, to invest. So they show that even if there's still war, but there are some things which is, uh, there's a lot of opportunity which you can take advantage and then help Congolese to come out of this war. My concern is uh, I'm Nande, but uh, I have some concern about your presentation because it seems to me like you are praising the relationship between the businessmen and uh, the local population. But uh, to see the average of the population, the poverty is still the higher. Uh, the businessmen are less than 1%. Uh, the, the rich people are less than one percent of the population, and uh, as you said, it's a. Uh, seems to me like they are, they are building up the relationship between the population. How did they give the population the right to be or, or to create the middle class in this community? Because it's they are working for the community. It should be this uh, kind of policy which are helping to the middle class to be more uh, involved or m to be created in this community. So mm -hmm. what do you think about this uh, model as a way to, to inspire other Congolese? Right, thank you. Um, I, I guess I really want to piggyback on the comments just made in a way. Um, I wonder in that respect how you would distinguish uh, the Nande situation with Katanga uh, and the dynamics in, in Katanga and also uh, on transparency issues uh, which would include weapons, minerals, trade or uh, Dodd-Frank, EITAI kinds of dimensions. How does that factor in? And uh, if there's time, uh, World Bank Group, U.S. government approaches uh, to the kinds of issues you have very eloquently discussed. Thank you. And then uh, let's get one from this side. Okay, up here. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jacques Bahati with the Africa Faith and Justice Network. I found very interesting this, uh, this approach, uh, this analysis. Um, I want to make a comment um, yeah, saying that uh, I studied with many Nande friends and uh, girls and boys. They also fit into the narrative of what is ill in Congo whether it's corruption or all these kind of things. So uh, as a country, we have this small part of the, you know, of, of uh, North Kivu that is doing fine. But also we have a lot of um, things uh, that we need to, to deal with as a community, as a country, including corruption, Busanyamwis with the uh, militia and all that kind of things. So I am, uh, Particularly, my, my question is, um, you know, what is it that um, you suggest from your study? What is it that we can do? 
um, what is the takeaway in some sense? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn to the panelists to uh, deal with those questions. A very interesting distinguishing from Katanga, uh, and I like the, the first question from our uh, from Anandi. But I'm going to do something rather unusual now because I am pressed for another engagement in just a few moments. So my uh, chief of staff, uh, Mamhadi Duke, is going to come over and take my chair, and we'll be able to continue just a little bit longer because we're not pressed in time. I see a great deal of interest around the table, so we'll be able to take at least one other round of questions. But I'm going to have to leave you. So, so you guys go ahead and handle these questions, and Mamhadi, who's a much more, uh, much nicer person to deal with, <laughs> will uh, will take over. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, for the first question, Sylvie, you're right. That's the problem, you know. Uh, I say that it's Congo is not a failed state. What a failed is a colonially imposed state. But in the configuration I described, you can see that uh, there need there is a need of an organization an organization which could foresee the redistribution. Because not everybody is millionaire, of course, as you can see. But what I've seen, I've noticed in Butembo, is that um, when you have one trader, rich, the car driver, the truck driver, the shopkeepers, most of them are from the, all his family. And they are paid peanuts. I've seen that $10 a month sometime. And this is something which needs to be addressed. I thought that the, the Catholic Church with its influence might challenge the traders on the way they treat the employee, at least. Let alone the fact that they monopolize the social surplus, the gold. But the Catholic Church will not do that. We had a meeting, I befriended many sons of traders, and we discussed about that, say, saying that if they are, there is more poverty, the first target would be yoga. They know it. And part of the response to that is to donate into all these charities, a school, a hospital, orphanages. But I agree with you, there need to be more systematic and formal way of foreseeing redistribution. This being said, I witnessed something very unusual. A shopkeeper who had been paid $20 a month. And a year later, he was able to buy a car. Say, what happened? With $20? Say, yes. What happened is that what the merchandise come with the boss, we set the prices. But I have my own price, according to my, the client. If I go there, I ask the price in Lingala, Swahili, I will have a price different from somebody who asks a price in Kinandi. So, and all the supplies, he managed to put it up aside for a year at least. That would help him. And the boss knows it, because we talked about it. They say, we don't pay them well, but we know also what they're getting behind that. It's a way for us to support them. But this is exceptional, you know. Not everybody is shopkeepers, but in a society we need to have real. That's where I think for me that I'm not against the state. I am for a state which grew up organically from the fight, the struggle of people not something which we have been colonially imposed and we're trying to get away of it. And the biggest problem, the two dynamic I see is that from inside, people want to pull away from this centralized state of Kinshasa, of Congo, to organize their own wealth. But from outside, the outside dynamic, they want to keep the Congo together, you know? That's why they send weapons to Kinshasa, they make, they send the UN to keep, this is the two dynamics confront each other. There is a centrifugal tendency within the Congo. People know that they could manage their wealth politically, economically better by being decentralized. 
But from outside, they want it to be one Congo. You know, if it's not controlled, the uranium will go to Al-Qaeda and will be attacked. So you have two dynamics playing. A centripetal movement from outside and a centrifugal movement from inside. So these are the real, the real fight challenge we have to speak nationally. Uh, Katanga dynamics, you know, uh, in Katanga is known as a mineral region. Katanga had the advantage of, over the Kivu, which is also a mineral region, in the sense that uh, the Société Générale, when the Belgian came, which became Jacamin later, was really centralized with opening schools, with it was a welfare state, actually, all the, along the, 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 the corridor, the, the copper, copper belt corridor. So people went to school. People uh, became doctors through the Jacamin school. We didn't have it in the East. People have to go to Kisangani to study. And so Nanda were left actually out during the entire time. So everything you found in the Nanda region come from people themselves, rather than, the, that's the major difference with Katanga. And uh, so the, the Dodd-Frank, the World Bank, or US government, government, for me, before they intervene, they need to understand the local dynamics. That is, you can't do shorter than this. But the problem is that people don't have time. People don't have time to understand that. It's easy to make a policy, you know. It's easy to criticize my, my. Uh, I remember I was giving a, this talk a few years ago and somebody would start criticizing, you know, the people you are promoting are cartel with uh, the, the militia, with all the criminal aspect of it. And my answer was that, yes, in the Congo, our militia, we call them Mai Mai. Somewhere else, they are called Blackwater Company contractors. It's the same dynamic. Wealth goes with a level of violence. I mean, this is, I mean, the US government need to learn a lot, and the World Bank even more. Uh, my friend Bahati, uh, yes, corruption. I think part of the solution is in the Congo Constitution which talk about decentralization, including fiscal decentralization. And the day we will do that, you could manage, you could control corruption. In Butembo, if somebody, if a trader doesn't do his 50 kilometers, the other will ask him, because all the truck are going through there. You have to justify, you know. Nyamwisi, when Kabila, the father, came to power, Nyamwisi, could have been appointed minister of defense, but the traders say no. As Tony said, in the Nanda, it's not the politicians who dominate, it's the traders. They say no because they knew that Nyamwisi were actually keeping some of the militia as a personal militia. If he become a minister of defense, this militia will grow and control. And he was appointed, I think, minister of foreign affairs instead. So they have a uh, big power. The only one of the solutions you ask for, my solution, is a real decentralization Kinshasa is afraid of. That is, I don't know. <laughs> yes, federal state with a huge autonomy. You already of have decentralization written into the Constitution, Ed. Yes. You don't have to change the Constitution. You just have to get the state to obey its own Constitution, which it's not. So just another sentence uh, about the final point, uh, I would only add to the fiscal decentralization, which I think is essential, that you have to have local authorities who have some sense that they're responsive to the local citizens. If local authorities still feel, as today, mm -hmm. that they're more responsible to Kinshasa, which after all appoints them, then you have a fundamental problem. If you have them responsible uh, to uh, local populations, as is created for specific reasons in the territory controlled by the Nande, then you're on your way to a solution. I also wanted to make one point about the middle question uh, and link the, the kind of the three parts of it. Um, uh, and I'll use the analysis I, I did before. There are huge differences between the areas controlled by the Nande and the province of Katanga. First, Katanga is huge. Katanga is the size of France. Katanga is the size of Texas. I mean, Katanga is gigantic. 
So it's much, much larger than this little part of you know, the northern part of North Cuba. So it's a, it's a little apples and oranges to compare the northern part of North Cuba to all of Katanga. At the very least, you have to break Katanga into a northern part and a southern part because there are very different characteristics in northern Katanga and southern Katanga. Um, next, Katanga is not ethnically homogeneous, so you don't have that. that that's a huge difference. Next, there have been, and maybe to some extent, at least a small sense of an interest in splitting away from the Congo. You still, it's, it's hard to get a sense of how strong that is in Katanga, but uh, since Katanga did split away for a little bit in the 60s, and there were some efforts in the 70s along those lines, you still hear little noise about that. Uh, the attacks that we've seen in Lubumbashi over the last couple years are very hard to figure out what they mean. Whether they have anything to do with a desire to separate from the Congo, I don't know. But in any case, that has existed in, in uh, Katanga. It does not exist in the territory controlled by the Nande. Um, uh, national, uh, politicians from Katanga have had a national focus. Uh, after all, Laurent Kabila and Joseph Kabila locate their backgrounds from uh, the northern part, actually, of Katanga. Um, so very, very important differences. The final one is, is perhaps the largest one of all. Uh, the resources of Katanga are so astonishing uh, that they come to the attention of actors all around the world. Uh, and so in Katanga, unlike other areas of the Congo, let's contrast mining copper and cobalt with mining gold. If you mine copper and cobalt the right way, you mine it the way Freeport McMoran is mining it today with a $2 billion investment and major mining operations. And it is not easy to mine copper or cobalt artisanally. You can't like put copper in your pocket. And there are smaller scale things you can do, but even the small scale things are more complicated than that. Gold, you can literally get a handful and you can put it in your pocket. And if it's real gold, you can go off to Abu Dhabi or any number of places in the world and you can make a lot of money. And it is very hard to control that. You can just walk across the border with your pockets filled and return with quite a lot of money. This is a very different economic dynamic between what is going on in um, particularly the southern part of Katanga and uh, the area controlled by the Nande. That links to your Dodd-Frank question because Dodd-Frank really is, the people behind it were intent on doing something that they of course called conflict minerals. Conflict minerals, by and large, are not in Katanga. Conflict minerals are not what we're talking about from the Nande zone. Conflict minerals today largely come from the southern part of North Cuba, so this other half of North Cuba. And so Dodd-Frank is really trying to do something about that particular area, a point that is often confused. Again, people think it's about eastern Congo, and they confuse the large-scale copper cobalt mining in Katanga with the, uh, the kind of criminal networks that are mining gold and tin uh, and other con conflict minerals largely in the southern part of North Cuba. Um, finally, uh, more about the World Bank than the U.S. approach. I'll just say a little bit about the World Bank approach. The World Bank president is, of course, in Kinshasa right now. Uh, I hope to see more from the World Bank focused on governance. Um, in some of the recent statements, you can look at statements even today made by uh, the World Bank president. Uh, if you just take those statements out of context, uh, frankly, they strike me as naive, that somehow uh, he talks about a peace dividend, that if we can sprinkle lots of money in the Congo, everything's going to be all right. You know, that's been tried before, and it has not worked out very well for the reasons, really, that Patience has, talk, has talked about and that I've tried, tried to talk about a little bit. Uh, money for development, I'm all for it, but it is not linked to fundamental governance and democratization reforms that money will largely be wasted. 
Great. If we have uh, just, I would say, two more questions because we are really beyond our time right now. Two questions and then we'll call it. <laughs> All right. Um, here, Herb. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, as an anthropologist who grew up in the Congo, I have to say that that's probably the best talk I've heard here. And I say that because it convincingly unites all the local elements that show how local Africans have created order in the midst of uh, what everyone else reports as chaos. In other words, it's African agency at its best and its most convincing. And I put it very much in the line with Theodore Treffon's book, Reinventing Order, where he focused on Kinshasa and all the local elements that go into getting water, getting your daily food, getting your kids educated, and getting them to a hospital, and how it varies like crazy. And to understand it requires knowing the local. So first, having gotten that off my chest, <laughs> I'm wondering if you'll push it further. I hear a lot of talk here about, about best practices and replicability. I'm wondering if you will reflect theoretically on what you see the effect of that being on the way analysts approach governance, not governments, which fail, but governance. Uh, I'm very curious how you feel about that. Much of my own impression, I will be heading for Sankulu next month. I work with African conservation groups to help them manage their own forests. I have had a real uphill slog in this city convincing people that Africans have any ideas or practices or forms of organization that have any applicability in world wildlife conservation programs. <laughs> Best practices, your thoughts. Uh, my name is Herbert Weiss. I'm associated with this center, but I have a long history in the Congo. <laughs> heard about you from my friend Pascal Kambale, who announced your book, and I'm not disappointed with your presentation. With your presentation. Um, a couple of comments. Um, I was in Butembo about 10 years ago, um, and was full of admiration for what had been done there, and indeed made the suggestion both to the World Bank and uh, USAID, that instead of wasting their money having seminars of million different kinds that were supposed to teach the Congolese elite how to do this or that, that they, from then on, have those seminars in Butembo, which would have been possible to do. Uh, of course, that was not accepted. Uh, but it suggests my second point which is that I think it is a model, and although it cannot be replicated exactly as it is, uh, its uh, value as a model sh should not be lost, but on the, on the, other on, on the contrary, should be, uh, should be viewed as real capital. Uh, yes, in Butembo, in one way, it's very easy because of this ethnic homogeneity. But it also has disadvantages. Uh, administratively, for instance, it isn't even a territory. Uh, that's a disadvantage. Uh, uh, other places have huge advantages, and other, eth other ethnic groups, but also other regions, have shown a capacity, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Quilu, an area that I'm particularly in, uh, interested in. I mean, there were moments when, uh, during the earlier phase of uh, uh, creating small provinces in the 60s, when uh, the Quilu was a uh, province pilote, and it is extremely multi-ethnic. I mean, the, 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 you know, there are just, just dozens of different ethnic groups. That didn't stop them from being able to get something going. So it's too pessimistic, it seems to me, not to view the accomplishments of Butembo and the people there uh, uh, as, as, as replicable. I think, it, you know, within limits and 
Yes, I agree, you need to know the local situation well, but given, given that, you can use it as a model. And I think it would, it would uh, psychologically, it is so important for the Congolese, in my opinion, to see what was done there, because it is, as you pointed out so well, uh, it is the people there who did it. It is, wasn't done for them. And uh, there is, of course, this, this psychological deficit of people in the Congo after years and years of colonial and very paternalistic colonial rule feeling, you know, well, I'm waiting for the state to do everything. Yeah? Uh, the, uh, I'll just make a couple of other points. Um, one is, uh, your triad of, uh, of people with power, it seems to me, leaves out the state. The state is there. The sûreté is not non de sûreté. The sûreté is Kinshasa sûreté. And if they want to put their hand on somebody, they can. Uh, secondly, the, when I was there at least, the whole structure of, uh, of customs control was not in the hands of the Nande, and the Nande had to pay in order to import. Uh, yeah. So, of course, there, were, uh, there was a lot of uh, well, gray area about that, but nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, this was a structure that was extremely important for what they were doing, and that was not in their hands. And don't forget that uh, the capital can also discourage, for instance, the question of the airport. Uh, you know, why was there no airport when they were willing to pay for an airport? Well, because Kinshasa said, pay or not pay, you're not allowed to do it. So I think that uh, you need to add the state, and it goes hand in hand with your observation that they don't really want secession. Yes, they want a lot of local autonomy, but they feel that they are part of a larger structure, namely the Congo. Uh, there is that reality in the Congo, uh, and, and uh, so that the presence of Kinshasa, of the national structure, uh, is both accepted and rejected in complex ways. I'll stop there. We'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and answer these, and we'll wrap up. Just a short comment, and then Tony might conclude. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that you quote Treffon, and especially uh, anthropologists, we've discovered more and more that um, the expert is the local. In 2004, Kunda, oh sorry, in 2004, uh, Sin DP of Kunda attacked Kanyabayonga. Kanyabayonga, that's where the district of Nanda started. And people ran away forever, a uh, few miles, uh, 25 miles away, to closer to Kaina. And the WFO came, World Food Organization, came with biscuit, tank, water. People say, no, 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 we don't need food. We grow food. What we need is to tell this guy to go away from our land. For the first time in the history of w, uh, World Food Organization, people refuse help. They're not stupid. They know what they want. They want their land. Why to eat biscuit? I mean, it's a, people are intelligent. So uh, in terms of even local governments, that's why for me... Uh, Real democracy starts by local democracy. People know who is who. And from there, you could go up. But of course, we, in our entertainment, democracy is presidential elections. I mean, coming from our thinkers. You know, it's a, so uh, that's how I could kind of theorize uh, the governance. It's much on the local, local democracy. That is uh, the comment that I make, yeah. Sure. Uh, just uh, a couple short comments. Uh, maybe we could talk later, Alden. I'm surprised that uh, you're finding people who don't think that there's any local wisdom in the Congo, because I know lots of people in Washington who understand that there's all sorts of local wisdom, not just in the Congo, but all over the place. So. 
Okay, it depends. It depends on the details of what you mean by that. But uh, uh, certainly, one should try to develop a keen sense uh, along the lines of what Patience laid out. This is why I hope many people will buy his book and read it to develop this kind of fine-grained understanding, and then try to incorporate that in programming and other decisions. Uh, the replicability question is complex, and I, I won't go into it in any kind of detail, as I think anyone who has been asking has had probably more questions about replicability than anything else during, during this session. And I think that some of the points that Dr. Weiss made are, of course, true. One wants to uh, cherish and publicize the positive story of economic development and relative peace in the context of uh, really terrible things happening literally on the door of this territory controlled by the Nandi and understand why and think about what that means. And I think it, it poses some very deep questions about where Congo is going to go over the next few decades. Will Congo as a whole go more in the direction of what we've seen in this area, uh, a part that despite problems of creating a middle class or other points that we've heard in this discussion, become an area that's peaceful, booming economically with those benefits uh, shared not just by a tiny elite, but shared by a much broader, even if they're not as equitably distributed as one might like, still benefiting, at least uh, I think patients would agree, and I've seen this when I've been to Butembo, to a rather broad um, set of people living in that area? Or will Congo look more and more like Haiti? Haitians, too, uh, have remarkably entrepreneurial individuals who have gone on to do remarkably impressive things that look a lot like what Nande traders have done in other countries. But their own country to today continues to be characterized by state dysfunction and de-development, despite the billions that have flown in since the earthquake to try to make the country work. And I will insist that, to me, the fundamental replicable question is, can one create the conditions of stability that flow from some kind of structure of reasonable governance. And the Nande have gotten it. Yes, there's a state there, but the Nande have set themselves up in opposition to that quite successfully and have found ways to control even the Sûreté, even the customs officials, even other actors of the Congolese state who swamp people in other parts of the country. This is part of the success story. But over time, you want something where populations don't have to worry about how do we control intelligence agencies? How do we get past corrupt customs officials? But that you have systems that are at least reasonable levels of governance so that the kinds of energies that we see so positively employed in this particular territory can spread as widely in the Congo as possible. Thank you very much for staying and uh, being able to um, stay past the time. They are here, so you'll be able to speak to them uh, afterwards. And please join me in thanking Patience and Tony for this very informative session. And books are outside, available to be bought. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. I put it to good use, so I, I think so as a good. Uh, I didn't want it out. Yeah.